Once upon a time there was a 12 year old kid with a tail, living in the woods all by himself, whose encounter with a funny haired, spoiled 16 year old girl could change his life for good. But this is not his story. Then, uh, once upon another time, there was a guy named Walter, who created a mouse wearing a black mask, who made his theatrical debut in November 1928, changing his life for good. But this is not his story either. This is the story of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, an older character created by this Walter guy, whom Universal Studios grabbed in 1928 and wanted him to become the protagonist of their cartoons. Thus, producer Charles Mintz hired struggling artists like Hugh Harmon, Rudolf Ising, Paul Smith, Max Maxwell, Rowling Hamilton and Isidore Freeling. But the outcome wasn't particularly successful, so in 1929 Universal decided to produce the Oswald series in-house, in Walter Land Studios, thus leaving Mintz animation staff out of work. End of the story. What now? What happens next? The unemployed animators led by Orman and Ising had to do something. And they did. They decided to produce their own cartoons, featuring a new character Orman and Ising created while working at Disney. His name is Bosco and their pilot episode title is Bosco the Talking Kid, released on May 29th, 1929, but never got to see the lights of theaters, and the audience got to realize his existence only 2000, 71 years later. This short is highly experimental, featuring Ising in the flesh drawing Bosco, who tries everything to annoy the cartoonist, like tap dancing, whistling, singing and playing the piano. While the short may have aged like milk, keep in mind it's highly experimental and quite innovative for its time, as a cartoon character gets to interact with a real life person and even breaks the fourth wall for the first time out of millions. Of course, this doesn't erase its flaw of looking too simplistic, but to Freeling's plea, he wasn't probably that confident of his skills eons prior to its explosion. Spoiler alert, this experimental short showcases one of the main goals of the upcoming harmonizing era, the usage of music, which would also result in suffocating and morbid setups. Nevertheless, Bosco the Talking Kid caught the attention of a man in particular, who took advantage of his connections with Warner Brothers Pictures to help the duo supply a new series featuring Bosco. His name was Leon Schlesinger. It seems like that was the turning point for both Orman and Dising after being ignored by Paramount and Universal. At long last they could create a series out of Bosco, but how are they going to call it? Well, the easiest solution would be combining their last names, thus creating Urbanizing Studios. It doesn't even sound that bad. But they preferred being inspired by silly symphonies from that other studio, because again, music represents the core of the Kansas City Duo's entertainment. Therefore, no wonder their series should be titled Looney Tunes. And it's probably better that way, as 1930 marks the beginning of one of the most, if not the most, influential periods in the history of animation. This is the pilot episode of the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies filmography dissection. Paul Smith, Max Maxwell, Rolling Hamilton and Isidore Freeling were among the animators of the brand new Bosco series by the Harmon and Ising duo. Starting with its theatrical debut Sinking in the Bathtub, released on April 19, 1930, which also introduces Bosco's girlfriend, Honey. Really? Honey? Anyway, the main goal of the Warner Brothers filmography dissection would normally be analyzing one or two shorts at a time. However, in this early instance I'm tackling every single one of these at once. Why? Because they are interchangeable. Seriously, they all look the same and share the exact same issues. They may have different settings, but the pattern is basically just one. Bosco dancing and creating music with the environment surrounding him. There is no other attraction. 
Sometimes a decent visual gag might pop up here and there, like the running joke of Bosco pulling music instruments out of his pants, which is kinda funny for how shady the scene is, or Bosco tuning the horse's tail in the booze hangs high, but without a proper story, the result in being directionless gag for their own sake. On top of that, Bosco and Honey are blatantly inspired by Mickey and Minnie. I mean, they are meant to be the Kansas duo's counterparts of the Disney couple. Honey seems to follow the specific female character pattern of the 30s. Since she's supposed to look different from Bosco, she wears a bow, a skirt and lace underwear underneath. More or less like Minnie. Yet something is off about them. Even though the early Mickey Mouse shorts don't leave me a positive impression, Steamboat Willie aside, they certainly had a charm within, as if they were aware of making history through their progression. They were quite unique for the time, as a result of the fact Bosco and Honey are their brazen copycats, sort of make them feel more unoriginal and obsolete than charming. Boxcar Blues may be considered a mere attempt of an action segment, but Frank Marcel's score still sounds too soft and bland for it to express some more intensity. Then again, its climax is only for the sake of more musical numbers. I do realize the primordial purpose of Looney Tunes was making music the protagonist, but if the gags showcase weak punchlines and the pacing is so sluggish, it's not a surprise to observe such underwhelming results. Unfortunately, 1931 Bosco is likewise bland and uninteresting, even though shorts like Big Man from the North and Ups and Downs attempt to sketch an actual plot. Too bad the sad plot literally vanishes once a musical number begins. Take Big Man for example. The main plot with Bosco hunting down a bandit is replaced by Honey Stains in the middle section, which has nothing, I mean literally nothing to do with the short itself. You could remove it and the story would flow regardless. Or ain't nature grand, whose lack of a cohesive story makes the whole thing even patchier than it already is. First Bosco goes fishing, then he chases a butterfly and gets bummed by dragonflies piloting a bigger insect. It's all over the place, which would normally be a good thing for Looney Tunes, but this isn't the Looney Tunes we all know yet. It just feels totally random because the show hasn't found its identity yet. Or The Three Sneeze, the last cartoon directed by Harmon and Dising as a duo, which has a rather feeble plot with Bosco eager to chop down some trees and a poop fake-out gag, but at some point the short deliberately forgets its plot, as it has the standard stock dancing maneuver start once again, acting as if they weren't using any animation whatsoever. In the meantime, Warner was producing a parallel series, Spoony Melodies, which was essentially bland music videos. Of course, given its flop and the decent feedback of the Looney Tunes series, Schlesinger felt he had to ride the Looney Wave. Thus, he came up with the idea of creating his canon sister, named Mary Melodies, whose shorts were directed by Ising alone, whereas Harmon stuck to Looney Tunes. 1931 would mark the distinction of Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies, exhibiting their early differences as Harmon would still place his bet on Bosco, while Ising would feature brand new characters in his Merry series, such as Foxy and Roxy, blatant Mickey and Minnie ripoffs disguised as Foxes, and Piggy wearing Mickey's shorts. Unfortunately, these shorts sound as banal as they're described, because they're just disjointed models filled with the same stock 30-esque entertainment, like random objects moving including buildings, and the never-ending music numbers which are essentially the plot. Once again, these cartoons are perfectly interchangeable, as the new characters appear as lifeless and uninspired tokens, and all they do is singing and dancing without providing any quirks whatsoever. 
Simultaneously, the Bosco series is following an unstable route, because it may be slightly less frustrating than Ising series, but is definitely still providing some rocky performances. While it seems to be detaching from music numbers in favor of slapstick comedy, as seen in Bosco the Dow Boy, a surprisingly okay short, and starts experimenting unique perspective as viewed in Bosco Shipwrecked, at the same time, the fact it has the urge to recycle previous situations, and most of all, to mimic Disney at all cost, sure diminishes any attempt to provide a positive output. This exactly sums up my thoughts on the Warner series in these early years. They are so derivative they lack a precise identity. They are being so stubborn to create their own Mickey Mouse, each one of their attempts manages to be a mere carbon copy. Next time there's going to be a new director in town.